Hi everyone, my name is Dion Roster and I'm the Scientific Programs and Outreach Manager at the Carnegie Institution for Science, and which basically means that I help bring programs like this to Carnegie and to our stage. And I'd like to actually introduce one of our newest programs. It's called Expedition Earth, and I have a slide up here. You might have seen the poster outside. Um, and as the name suggests, Expedition Earth brings field scientists, conservationists, and nature photographers that travel Earth for the sake of scientific discovery to this stage, followed by an in-depth conversation with the presenter and other panelists. Our goal is for you, the audience, to get behind the scenes with the presenter, hearing not only what they learned, but how and why they chase their answers. You'll be a part of their personal journey of discovery. Tickets are a modest $35, but include the presentation and a panel conversation, plus a receptionist, a reception, where you mingle with presenters, maybe receptionists, um, <laughs> presenters and, and other event participants. Your ticket includes one free adult beverage and snacks, so you really can't beat that. Our first event will be on October 20th, and this will feature one of the greatest nature photographers of our time, Franz Lanting. Commissioned frequently by the National Geographic, Franz has shot in remote locations from the Congo to Madagascar to South Georgia Islands to Borneo to Africa, uh, Antarctica. On October 20th, he will explain how his images, what he calls conversations with nature, have been influenced throughout his career by science and technology. After his presentation, he will be joined on stage with Washington Post Science Health and Environment Editor, Laura Helmuth, who will serve as our moderator and the director of the Smithsonian Center for Conservation and Sustainability, Francisco Delmeyer, the president of Carnegie Institution for Science, Matthew Scott. Before we move on to tonight's program, I'm gonna have my first and hopefully not my last Oprah moment because two lucky visitors here today, audience members, have on the, your seat number is on the left hand armrest. If you came in and there was a piece of tape on the left hand armrest of your chair that said do not remove, I actually do want you to remove it and I want you to come find me at the end of the program and I'll gift you with a free ticket to our show. In addition, one lucky visitor in our overfloor room also has a ticket underneath their seat. So, I'm very excited. That's hopefully, again, not my last of my Oprah moments, but I'm, I'm glad two, three of you get free tickets to our show on October 20th, and I hope the rest of you come as well. So thank you again, I hope to see you there, but now I'd like to introduce Carnegie Science Deputy, Margaret Merchant, to introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you. Good evening, thank you all for joining us for our first talk of the season. I'm very excited to have you here. Uh, as Dee said, I'm Margaret Mershon. I'm the Science Deputy here at Carnegie Science. And before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to point out that we have two Carnegie family members in the audience this evening that have received great honors this week. Uh, first, Dr. Maxine Singer, who I didn't see on the way in, but I, oh, okay. Um, Ah, okay, excellent. <laughs> Hi, Maxine. Former president of Carnegie, uh, received the Hans Bethe Prize last night here in DC from the Federation of American Scientists for her leadership and advocacy in the safe and ethical use of uh, new biotechnology. And also, someone I did see, Dr. Robert Hazen, staff scientist at our geophysical lab, received the Roebling Medal this week in Denver. This is the highest award granted by the Mineralogical Society of America and was given for his exceptional work on mineralogical evidence of the evolving relationship between the geosphere and the biosphere. And let's congratulate them both one more time. Now, onto the topic at hand. Nature does not lend itself easily to quantification or experimentation. The patterns of life, interconnected with cycles of the Earth, as seen in Bob's work, are complicated and highly dynamic, and they operate on scales we cannot easily observe within our lifetimes. 
Yet, in the 150 years since Charles Darwin wrote The Origin of Species, challenging us to contemplate the so-called tangled bank of interrelationships, ecologists have managed to disentangle the complexities and to understand the principles that give rise to them. Today, ecologists increasingly warn us that humans are disrupting this natural balance. There are plenty of doomsayers and pessimists who think that Earth will never recover, but not tonight's speaker. Sean Carroll argues that because we understand the laws of nature, we can, if our collective will is strong enough, use them to restore the health of our planet. Dr. Carroll's own research is in the field of evo-devo, meaning the interface between developmental biology and evolution. His findings have illuminated how the structures of animals are encoded in the genes, or the why do I look like my parents question. Dr. Carroll's studies have shown how changes in genes that control body shape underlie evolution itself. Dr. Carroll did his graduate work in immunology at the Tufts University School of Medicine. He then joined our own Carnegie president, Matthew Scott, for postdoctoral research at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Professor Carroll ran a highly productive research lab for many years at the University of Wisconsin in Madison before joining the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, where he is now. Dr. Scott was unable to be here tonight due to Carnegie business on the West Coast and in Japan, but he hates to miss this evening and sends warm greetings to his friend, who he describes as his amazing friend. Dr. Carroll is an award-winning scientist, author, and educator. He is vice president of science education for the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and he is the Alan Wilson Professor of Molecular Biology and Genetics at the University of Wisconsin. His research focus is on the genes that control animal body patterns, and that play important roles in the evolution of animal diversity. Dr. Carroll's deep understanding of biology and his flair for explaining it have made him one of the most important and gifted science writers we have today. He has written five books, including Remarkable Creatures, which, is one, which was a National Book Award finalist, and Brave Genius, a book a, about an unlikely friendship between a biologist and a writer during World War II. His most recent book, the topic of tonight's lecture, is the Serengeti Rules. Dr. Carroll has received numerous awards, both for his science and for his writing, including the Benjamin Franklin Medal in Life Sciences, the Stephen Jay Gould Prize, and in March of this year, the 2016 Lewis Thomas Prize. In addition to writing, he is also the executive producer of a series of films about evolution and ecology made by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. With a nod to Darwin, the Institute's production company is entitled Tangled Bank Studio. Dr. Carroll is narrator and host of some of these wonderful films. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Sean B. Carroll. Well, thanks, Margaret. It's just great to be here. I think this is the nicest venue in Washington, D.C. Um, it's great to be back to the Carnegie. Um, Thank all of you for coming out on a rainy night to hear a talk about science. <laughs> it better be halfway decent, especially since I have family and friends here, even neighbors. So, uh, gosh, I don't know what's going to happen if this goes downhill, but let's just hope that doesn't go that way. Um, so thank you for the kind introduction and the opportunity to, to uh, talk about the Serengeti rules. My tale tonight is going to begin in the Serengeti, and we'll get there in a minute, but I wanted to give you a little context uh, a couple of years ago, I just wrapped up work on a film for the Smithsonian Channel called Mass Extinction. And in the course of that film, we looked back in the past at mass extinctions, but also looked around at what was happening in the world today. And I, I did that with a few ecologists, and that gave, I'm not an ecologist. I was looking through their eyes at various parts of the world. And even visiting places like Yellowstone National Park, I learned that you know, even the most, some of the most protected places on the planet were showing signs of trouble. And like you, I saw, you know, headlines like these in the news, you know, half of all wildlife had disappeared in the last 40 to 50 years or so. And, uh, you know, read stories like this, that they're contemplating putting a paved highway right through the middle of the Serengeti in Tanzania. And it was headlines like these that, you know, made me worry that uh, I, I needed to see some of these places. I'd never been to the Serengeti and I, I wanted to see them, you know, because they might not survive. And I also wanted my family to see them. So in the summer of 2014, that's where we went. Uh, there are going to be some home movies and home pictures here, which might violate some code of public speaking, but hey, I, you know, 
it, it's the best shots I've got. Um, so uh, this is my clan at the very fancy eastern entrance gate to Serengeti National Park. That, that is exactly what it looks like. Um, I'll give you another view looking down that gate. So we, um, we all uh, were, were in a vehicle together for many days in northern Tanzania. And with great anticipation, we started rolling down this gravel road uh, into the great Serengeti. That was late June, and you can see uh, the grass looks fairly brown, and it was maybe about knee high. And as we're driving and driving, we're looking and looking, and you know, I'm starting to get a little worried because I'm I'm the only biologist in my family. And uh, well, we did eventually see this lion. But as you can see, we saw the top of this lioness. And I'm thinking, um, you know, if this is the way it's going to be for five or six days, you know, they're going to toss me out of the car and drive back to the airport. So, um, but fortunately, as we drove a little further, a little deeper into the Serengeti, we started to see some, some flecks of green, a few acacia trees, and a little wandering creek bed. And we came up over a rise, and well, this is, this is exactly how it looked, home movies. So um, we were just surrounded by a couple thousand zebra, just stripes in every direction. And um, as I looked to the west towards some hills, you could see now coming down to this water hole was sort of the dawn patrol. And this is what I had in mind. Actually, I didn't even have this in mind. The Serengeti was better than what I had in mind. Because from that moment on, for the next several days, the Serengeti offered up an unending canvas of animals of all sizes and shapes and colors, from you know sturdy little warthogs to lounging hippos, which is what they largely do, um, sleek impala, majestic giraffes. This is favorite animal for my wife and I. We we stopped the vehicle every time we came across giraffes, which was uh, many many scores of times. Um, I probably don't have to even say anything about this. Um, this, this little beauty say, shared a private evening and morning with, with all of us while she dined on a freshly caught gazelle. And as I gazed across this you know, just enchanting landscape, I, I, was, I was awestruck. You know, I'm a biologist. I've been some other pretty cool places, but I was just not prepared for the enormous numbers of animals that I was seeing. But I was also a bit unsettled because it, I, it, it occurred to me that I didn't understand anything about what I was looking at. I didn't understand the simplest features of the Serengeti, the simplest questions that I might be asked by my own family in that car. Like, why are there so many wildebeest and say, so few topi, another grazer of about the same size as the wildebeest? And that's somewhat embarrassing because I, as Margaret explained, I'm a professional biologist. I've worked on the making and evolution of the animal kingdom for over three decades. I've even worked on how animals get their stripes and their spots. Now, not exactly, um, you know, this is perhaps not the most charismatic animal, that I, but it's paid my mortgage. Um, <laughs> and nonetheless, and it's a little easier to work on than, than zebras and giraffes. But, but nonetheless, um, I, you know, I, I did not understand how the Serengeti worked. I didn't understand this incredible profusion of so many different kinds of animals. Now, what I did understand, particularly from several decades of work and what biologists have been up to for a long time, is that inside animal bodies, everything is regulated. And let me explain what I mean by that that every substance in your body, every fat, every hormone, every enzyme is regulated and kept in a relatively narrow range. There are mechanisms in your body to control virtually everything. And every cell type in your body, every white cell, every red cell, every skin cell, every gut cell, every type of cell is maintained in a particular range. Different ranges, there's really different numbers of, say, liver cells, from pancreas cells, from muscle cells, but nonetheless, those are all maintained. And that's really important to us because when the amount of some substance is off, we may not feel well, we may be really sick. When the numbers of these cells are off, we may have problems in either direction diseases like anemia or, of course, things like cancer. So regulation is really important to the maintenance of our health. 
And this has been the focus, understanding how this regulation works has been the focus of a huge branch of biology, mostly my branch, molecular biology, for the last 50 or 60 years. So to understand how life works, we need to know these rules of regulation. And let me tell you what I mean by that. Um, to use sort of a sports analogy, that there are players in the body, molecules, that regulate any given process, whether that's, you know, from ovulation to sleep. And what biologists try to do is try to figure out the rules that govern their play. Identify those key players, figure out the rules that govern their play. And that knowledge has armed us with the ability to then intervene in the body systems as we do in medicine. And this has been a revolution over the last 50 or 60 years. Um, I'll give you a couple examples. So on the left is genetically engineered insulin, which of course is used to treat diabetes. And that is again, a, a, essentially a disease of regulation of not properly controlling our blood, blood sugar. On the right is a statin called Lipitor. There's many different kinds of statins. That exploits the principles that have been discovered of the regulation of cholesterol metabolism to control the amount of particular types of cholesterol in our bodies and has a big impact on uh, cardiovascular disease. And this general strategy is once you know the rules of regulation, well, you can restore missing players, in this case, things like insulin, or you can um, fix broken links. And that's what goes on, for example, with cholesterol regulation. And that's garnered tons of Nobel Prizes and resulted in the invention of drugs you know, worth tens and tens of billions of dollars. Um, so we know that's what goes on inside bodies, but what I wanted to know is I want to know what regulates the numbers of bodies, these massive herds that I'm seeing across the Serengeti. And I didn't really know as I stared across that landscape. I didn't know how the numbers of animals and plants are regulated. I didn't know are there rules that even govern life at the larger scales. Now it turns out there are those rules, which is helpful if you're going to write a book about them. I just had to discover them. And the book, I, I really, I tell some of the stories of the pioneers who've worked out the rules of regulation in the human body, but tonight I'm going to talk about really the second major focus of the book, which are these rules that operate on a larger scale. Now, I've called these the Serengeti rules. Um, that's just me putting a label on them, um, because you can see them all in operation there, and that's where I'm going to take you. But they operate around the globe, and that's what's really important to understand, to address the question of how can we use the knowledge of these rules to preserve or even cure the ailing ecosystems. So in the first part of my talk, I'm going to discover some of those rules along with you. And in the last part of my talk, I want to give a couple examples of how knowledge of these rules um, can allow us to enable us to restore some great wildernesses on the planet. I want to start out with a little history of the Serengeti that I thought you might find interesting. Okay, so it's got a famous name, but really for the first half of the 20th century, Serengeti was not a tourist destination. Um, the world was preoccupied with other things, uh, world wars. It was not easy to get to northern Tanzania. Um, there were not facilities there. So some of the first people that really started arriving in the Serengeti in the 1950s were biologists. And what do biologists do when they confront these enormous numbers of animals? They count them, okay? So that was one of the first priorities, and I want to take you along. You know, they just want to find out how many are there of these different kinds of animals. So I'm going to show you um, how that's done, and it comes from a, a clip from a movie made in the late 1950s that involved a father and son team um, from Germany, from uh, Bernard and Michael Jimmick. There's Bernard on the left and his son Michael on the right, and uh, this is how they're going to go counting in their rather natally painted plane. And they and a couple other spotters are going to climb into the plane with uh, essentially notepads, clipboards, and they are going to take off. And this is, uh, this is computer graphics circa 1959 Hollywood. This is the pattern that they're going to fly across the Serengeti back and forth. And they're going to fly low and slow and count animals. Are you ready? Here we go. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. This is exactly what they're doing. At that speed, he, he's, he's, he's taking off the numbers, okay? So they're flying about 120 miles an hour. Uh, the wildebeest and other animals are, of course, not standing still when you're flying just above them. And uh, they did this day after day in January 1958 uh, with all these spotters to figure out exactly what's in the Serengeti. And this, in fact, is a documentary film, Serengeti Shall Not Die, that won the Oscar for documentaries that year. Okay, so what did the Jimmicks come up with? 
for their survey show in January 1958? Well, 99,481 wildebeest. Okay? And with uh, similar Teutonic precision, 57,199 zebra. Okay? You know, not 200, not 201, not 198. Okay? 5,000 or so topi and 1,800 buffalo and just 60 elephants. So in the 1950s, there were very few elephants in the Serengeti. That was still really a hangover from the ivory trade in the 19th century and early 20th century. Just a few um, elephants that migrated in. But all told, over 366,000 large mammals, large enough to count from the air in the Serengeti. And they allowed that maybe they might have missed at the fringes. Of course, they were flying day after day and animals do move around. They, uh, they said maybe they missed about 10,000. But to them... This was still an astounding number, 366,000 animals. And they worried. They worried aloud. They said, were there enough plains, mountains, river valleys, and bush areas to maintain the last giant herds still in existence? They were anxious. Now, uh, an answer to their question would materialize actually fairly soon after this survey, but it wasn't the answer that they expected or perhaps really feared. And that answer started to materialize when a young Oxford undergraduate named Tony Sinclair arrived in the Serengeti in the mid-1960s. Now, Tony traveled down with an Oxford faculty member. He was really keen on birds. There's a lot of birds in East Africa, a lot of birds in the Serengeti. He wanted to study the birds of the Serengeti. Um, but he arrived at the time they were doing another annual survey of animals. So they put him onto the, onto the aerial survey. And in the course of that survey, a little mystery uh, manifest itself. Um, Tony was involved in counting the buffalo in the Serengeti. And what he found was that uh, in 1965, they tabulated about 37,000 buffalo in the Serengeti. And uh, that was a big jump from 16,000 that had been counted just a few years earlier. So at the end of his time in the Serengeti, they said uh, he had decided he'd became so enamored with the place that he really wanted, after graduation, to do his PhD studies in the Serengeti. And they said, well, Tony, I, we know you like birds, but do you think you could handle, you know, a PhD on buffalo? And he said, sure. And so he, he returned to the Serengeti, and over the next about dozen years, he focused on a few key questions. Um, and this is Tony studying buffalo. This buffalo is sedated. Um, or I wouldn't be telling this story about Tony's work. Why were the buffalo increasing from 16 to 37,000? And what explained the great differences in the numbers of different kinds of animals in the Serengeti? And really, what was in Tony's heart was the question, you know, why is the magnificent Serengeti the way it is? So that's what I want to focus on for a little chunk of time here and explain to you what Tony was able to uncover uh, on the Serengeti. Well, the first thing he did to study the buffalo increase, he first had to verify that that was true. Of course, he could have made a mistake in counting. I guess you can overcount buffalo by 21,000. But um, so he continued on the surveys in subsequent years, and the pattern held up. So in fact, the number of buffalo kept increasing in subsequent years to 54,000, 58,000. So almost quadrupling in a little more than a decade. So the buffalo re were really increasing. So there's the mystery. And Tony, like all scientists, really has to play detective. And he has to come up with an explanation. Why are the buffalo increasing? Well, you can kind of join in this. Just start thinking. It, that you don't have to have much, you don't have to have any background. You just have to sort of think about your own life. Um, why would the buffalo be, be increasing? You can even shout it out if you want. Okay, I gave you the first one. All right. More food. Fewer predators. We'll get to that one in a second. Good job, you're all making hypotheses. So more food. Well, from the aerial surveys, buffalo are grazers. They looked at the grasses. It really looked like the, the Serengeti looked as productive um, in the 1960s as it did in the 1970s. They really didn't see any pattern that would explain a major change in, in food. So as some of you are, so this, he was able to eliminate that possibility. But as you um, called out, you know, naturally you might think that there were fewer predators and therefore the buffalo were, were having a better time of it. Um, so Tony actually looked at the census numbers, and it turns out um, that was not the case. In fact, there were more predators on the Serengeti in the early 1970s than the early 1960s. So, hmm, this is a bit puzzling. So why would there still be more buffalo if there are more predators? It means, of course, that 
The Buffalo numbers are increasing. That might mean, of course, more are being born or fewer are dying. So Tony thought of a third possibility. Some of you might have heard. Competitors, that's a good idea. Um, I'll give that one away, which was they're out on the grasslands. There are other animals out there, but it turns out there's kind of a general trend going on that other animals are increasing, and I'll tell you about one of them in a second. So you couldn't find a competition explanation here. Fewer poachers, that's a good one. The numbers are increasing. Yeah, weather. Well, weather would probably affect the amount of food. Let me just think, one way to die is from predators. Think of other ways to die. Well, there you go. Did you read a book recently? <laughs> Nicely done. So the, the call was disease and or rebounding from an epidemic. Let's follow that line of inquiry. Uh, <laughs> disease. So what Tony knew was there are other reasons why buffalo would die. In fact, buffalo carried a number of diseases, but there was one disease in particular that Tony had in mind, and it was called um, rinderpest or, or cattle plague. It was uh, unfortunately well known in East Africa. It arrived in the late 19th century, and uh, important to my story, it hits three animals, uh, cattle, domesticated cattle, buffalo, and wildebeest, and it hit regularly, sometimes in, in consecutive years, sometimes every few years. And um, here's a horrible picture from the early uh, 20th century. And wildlife were thought to be the reservoir that were, uh, of course, affecting the, the cattle herds. Uh, but a cattle vaccination program had been launched in the early 1960s um, that was vaccinating the cattle of the various um, uh, domesticated herds by the, that were being, for example, moved around the Serengeti by the pastoralists. And uh, so Tony suspected there might be something here. And so if that was the case, if there was some relationship between rinderpest and buffalo, he thought, well, let me see whether or not the exposure of buffalo to this virus has changed over the years. So what he did is he got a, samples from a whole lot of buffalo that he knew that he could figure out the age of the animal and looked in their blood for antibodies because when buffalo or humans are exposed to a virus, they make antibodies. So that would be a signal that they had been exposed at some time to the rinderpest virus. And when he looked and plotted this, the exposure of animals to the virus, he had a real eureka moment, which is he found that no buffalo born after 1964 showed any sign of exposure to the virus. So this was a really good correlation. The virus was disappearing from the Serengeti and buffalo numbers were booming. Well, that seemed like a pretty good correlation, but Tony knew there would be one other, perhaps, uh, way to confirm this idea. So he knew that one other wildlife species was affected by rinderpest, and that was wildebeest. So he was beginning to pay much closer attention to wildebeest numbers, and he was, pay he was participating in the wildebeest surveys. So let me show you what happened to wildebeest numbers over the same period of time. Yeah, that's a lot of wildebeest. <laughs> so you know, remember, the Jimmicks were worried that the Serengeti couldn't support 400,000 large animals. But before Tony's very eyes, the wildebeest herd picked up more than a million members. So, and he did the same test. He went to the wildebeest, aged match, got blood samples, and looked for the evidence of exposure to the virus in their blood and found the same pattern. In fact, the wildebeest, none of the wildebeest born after 1963 showed any exposure to the virus. So he really had his explanation that the eradication of this virus through the cattle vaccination program had now sort of taken this uh, scourge away from the wildlife populations and now they were booming. And of course it turned thinking upside down because the cattle herders thought that the wildlife was the source of the virus. I always blame the wildlife. But in this case, it was the cattle that, that were the reservoir of the virus. And by vaccinating them, you had this spillover benefit to the wildlife. Okay. So remove the virus and the buffalo and the wildebeest are booming. Well, in the course of this time, studying the Serengeti year in and year out, Tony and, and his colleagues noticed some other changes taking place in the Serengeti. And I want to just give you three observations and then we'll try to connect the dots and try to explain all these changes that were taking place in the Serengeti. So the first is um, changes in the pattern of fire on the Serengeti. So fire is an annual event on the Serengeti. But if you looked at the percent of the area of the park burned um, each year and looked in different regions, it was a pretty dramatic change over a decade where most of the park was burning in the early 1960s, but the 
frequency of fire, the fire coverage in the park, and in fact, the intensity of those fires was way down a decade later, okay? So fewer and less intense fires. Give you another observation. More giraffes. And who doesn't like more giraffes, okay? Third observation. You have to look carefully at these photos. They're taken over a long period of time from the same vantage point, unfortunately, on this one on a cloudy day. But you're looking at the same uh, uh, viewpoint across the Serengeti over a period of three decades. And what you can see is that the foreground is really filling in with trees, mature trees, till essentially really full of trees here by uh, just a few years ago. But if you looked in the, in the early, in the late 1970s, early 1980s, you could tell there were a lot of young trees um, that were beginning to grow on the Serengeti. Now let's connect those dots, okay? How might we explain these observations? Well, you've eliminated this virus, and I've already told you what happens, the two obvious things that's happened eliminating that virus, is that the populations of things like wildebeest and buffalo are booming. But what do things like wildebeest and buffalo eat? Grass. Well, what does grass do when it dries out? Fuels fires, right? So if there's more animals to eat the grass, there's less leftover grass in the dry season, so you have less and shorter grass. In fact, the wildebeest mow that grass down from about 30 centimeters to about 10 centimeters. So there's less and shorter grass. That means fewer and less intense fires. Well, what does fire do when it burns across the Serengeti? It burns up the little seedlings, right? So with fewer and less intense fires, you wind up with more trees. Now, what happens when you have more trees? Well, with more trees, you got more food for things that like to graze on those acacia trees. You also, as it turns out, you have more cover for carnivores. You have more nesting sites for birds. Lots of other things are changing on the Serengeti. In fact, out on the plains, the grassy plains, when that grass gets mowed down, it's better habitat for butterflies, okay? Fewer grasshoppers can live out there. So all sorts of animals and plants are being impacted by especially this wildebeest boon. So if you ask Tony Sinclair what makes the Serengeti the way it is, now think about almost every film you've seen on television. If it's about Africa, if it's about the savanna, within the first 90 seconds, you're going to see a cat chase a gazelle or an impala and eat it, right? It's all bloodlust, right? But the, what makes the Serengeti the way it is, through Tony's eyes, and I think now through our eyes, it, it's really one million lawnmowers. <laughs> that that giant herd of wildebeest, and they make a 600-mile circuit around the Serengeti, seasonal circuit around the Serengeti as they migrate, mowing that grass down, changes the habitat so profoundly that it has a big impact on the plant and other animal life. That's what makes the Serengeti the way it is. And that brings me to my first Serengeti rule. There'll be four tonight. They're going to go a little quicker now. But, um, and, and Serengeti rule number one, it's a paraphrase of a, of a saying from a great ecologist, and that is that you know, some animals are more equal than others. It's also a paraphrase from George Orwell. In that some, and here's a, a, a term ecologists use, are keystone species. They regulate community diversity. They have a disproportionate effect on the diversity of life in the systems in which they live, in the habitats where they live. This name comes not from the Serengeti. So everything I'm going to tell you about the Serengeti, while true, um, and was discovered in the Serengeti, the basic ideas were actually discovered elsewhere in the world, and you can just see them in operation in the Serengeti. And the Keystone idea came from zoologist Bob Payne actually working in tide pools on the Pacific Northwest coast of the United States. And he showed that, for example, starfish were keystone species in that system. And then this frenetic diagram over on the right here, which I haven't figured out any way to slow down, <laughs> explains the idea that came, came to, to, to Bob when he studied the, the role of starfish. He saw that when he removed starfish, the whole diversity of the system collapsed to just a, a couple of species from a much more diverse community. And he said, well, this, that, that species is like a keystone in a Roman arch, where it's, the keystone is sort of holding the arch together, and when we remove the keystone, the arch collapses. So wildebeest are keystones, in, in the Serengeti, and starfish or keystones in Pacific Northwestern tide pools. Bob Payne also came up with an idea to, uh, with a term to describe this sort of chain reaction that I was showing you earlier of how um, 
creatures at sort of different places in the food chain wind up affecting the abundance uh, or the presence even, or absence even, of, of other sorts of species. So when I talk about the food chain, we know that it, the simplest food chain has plants, which feed the plant eaters, and then there may be carnivores, that, of course, that eat the plant eaters in turn. But what you have here is a plant eater, the wildebeest, by mowing the grass, affecting the fire regime, affecting the trees, affects giraffes, birds, butterflies, grasshoppers, etc. Each of those levels of the food chain are technically termed a trophic level in biology. And so this is called a trophic cascade. And it's these cascading effects that ecologists never anticipated, that there could be really strong indirect effects by certain species upon others, by you know, animals upon plants, or animals upon other animals mediated by their effects on plants. Which quickly brings us to our second Serengeti rule. You're that much closer to the parking lot. Okay? Um, and that is that some species have strong indirect effects on other species through these trophic cascades. So you can imagine it's really important to know these very strong indirect effects wherever you may be in the world. And I'll get to that a little bit later. Okay, so wildebeest are really important. They have these strong indirect effects. But you might start thinking, what, what, what eventually happened to those wildebeest in, in East Africa? If they were, you know, they were just exploding in the 1970s, did that keep going? Of course, if it kept going, actually by now, all of East Africa would be wildebeest. And they'd probably be piled up, you know, one on top of each other. Um, so let me talk about what happened to the wildebeest because it will bring me to a really important uh, principle, another important insight about what controls the numbers of things in nature. So it turns out that that 1.4 million year, 1977, was the peak wildebeest year. The population did eventually level off right around about a million, so it sort of declined over subsequent decades just a little bit. Um, so it sort of overshot a little bit, but look at how steeply it grew from the 50s when the Jimmicks made their survey and uh, through the 70s when Tony Sinclair was there. So what's going on here? What, what regulates the wildebeest? Why were they booming here and why did they level off down here? Okay, so let's think again about sort of the food chain and again, common sense question, what could be regulating the wildebeest? Well, of course, it could be predators that would eat them and control their numbers, or it could be the amount of food available. And ecologists refer to this just in shorthand as sort of top-down or, or bottom-up control of any given species. So before I tell you what's going on with the wildebeest, I want to share with you what's been discovered, again, by Tony Sinclair and his colleagues, in general about animals on the Serengeti. And this is, I'm going to show you a graph, which, you know, on a Thursday night about 7 o'clock might be the most dangerous thing I could ever do. But this is one of my favorite graphs, because if you get this, you just, ah, this is the logic of how nature works. And this simple graph reflects so much observation time by field ecologists out in the Serengeti in East Africa. I just, you know, have endless admiration for the achievement. So this was done, work done with, by Tony Sinclair, Simon Mduma, and, Jason, and uh, Justin Brashears over a period of years. So what am I plotting here? We're asking the question, are Serengeti mammals, which ones are regulated from the top down by predators or from the bottom up by food? And what's plotted here are from observational data, the percent mortality that's due to predation. So what percent of mortality is due to predation um, of these various species? And it's plotted against animal body size on a log scale. So let's start up here in the upper left uh, with the oribi or the impala or the topi. Essentially 100% death by predation. I, I just have to say, I admit, it makes me wonder what oribi parents say to their children. <laughs> You know, someday you'll be eaten. And it turns out for Oribi, the smallest here, that predation reflects not just the cats, but about 10 different predators, because large uh, raptors as well as snakes are, are taking Oribi. So there's many, many predators out there when you're Oribi size. But as you work your way to, higher, to larger body size down here to the right, now let's go to the extreme right over here, the familiar elephant. Look at this. Elephant, hippo, rhino, zilch. I mean, it might occasionally happen, but really not significant at all. Well, these are really large animals, very difficult for predators to take down. So what you're really seeing are two strategies at work in the Serengeti. These animals, small body size, 
rapid reproduction rates, rapid maturation times, okay? Kind of the live fast, die young James Dean style, okay? These over here, this is kind of the Marlon Brando all-you-can-eat side of the, of the graph. So this is just get big, okay? But you can imagine, you, you might think, and I think especially, you know, come on, we're Americans. We probably, you know, we go for this. But, um, but the problem here, of course, is you need a lot of food to maintain this lifestyle. So you are vulnerable to the amount of food. So what you're seeing is that animals at this end of the spectrum, they're food regulated. Animals at that end of the spectrum, they're predator regulated. And there's something sort of in between. So where do the wildebeest fall? Okay. Well, they're basically food regulated. Food regulates the wildebeest. This, is, this has been well studied. And I want to just explain to you how this works because this will give you a little insight into the numbers of things in nature. Just looking at this curve, what's going on at the two ends of the spectrum here when they're, when they're really experiencing a high growth rate and when they're declining. And what's going on is that growth is high when the food per capita is plentiful. The Serengeti, essentially, in the late 1950s was empty from the wildebeest perspective. Plenty of food, right? And so their populations are growing really at a maximum rate. But as the Serengeti fills up with wildebeest and to some degree buffalo and other things, the amount of food per capita declines and the growth declines, I meaning it actually falls off. Mortality exceeds birth rates. And this is particularly in, in areas like the Serengeti that go through a wet and a dry season. The dry season is a really high stress period, and that's where you have a lot of mortality that animals don't make it through the dry season as they starve and run out of food. So that's really the check on wildebeest populations. Now, I talk about density because it's really it's a per capita sort of thing. When there's Low density, there's plenty of food for individual, growth rates are high. High density, growth rates may tip over and turn negative. And that brings me to my third Serengeti rule. Regulation of some, actually many species of all kinds across the world, depends upon their density. You'll see why this is important uh, shortly. So um, it explains why and how populations can rebound really sharply after their numbers are reduced, okay? But density, really just a, a way to regulate the numbers of things by food, sort of almost a feedback type mechanism. All right, so why have I told you things on this area? Again, density regulation of animal populations, that was discovered well before Tony Sinclair in general in the world. You can just see it in operation in the Serengeti. So everything I've told you operates in the Serengeti, but was discovered by zoologists first elsewhere. But why have I told you these stories? Well, first I thought that these, um, at least these are fairly familiar animals to you and you can sort of understand the logic of what's going on um, in the Serengeti. But also I tell you this because every place is a Serengeti. Wherever you have essentially the three levels of the food chain of plants, producers that feed the herbivores that are in turn food for predators, for carnivores, you have the potential for keystone species, trophic cascades, and the sort of rules that I've been telling you about. Every place is a Serengeti, and I mean that. From a leaf on a rose bush in your backyard with aphids and ladybugs, to a neighborhood pond with predatory fish and crustacea and algae, to the ocean shore with scallops and rays and sharks, to tropical forest, to the African plain, these are rules, these are phenomena we see in operation across the globe. So if we can understand those rules, we have a shot at intervening and perhaps restoring places that are no longer intact. So just as I described to you for the human body, to intervene in ecosystems, we need to understand the rules of regulation. The same idea, just as there are key molecules that regulate processes in your body, I showed you there are key species that regulate community structure in various habitats around the world. We gotta figure out the rules that govern their play. How do they influence the abundance of other creatures? And we gotta think about replacing what is missing or fixing broken links. So I'm gonna to close tonight with uh, two stories, two examples from different parts of the world. Um, one perhaps familiar to you, maybe one much less so. Um, so every place is a Serengeti, so let's even a place, Yellowstone in, in uh, the American West has even been dubbed the American Serengeti. 
Um, one of its outstanding features, in fact, across the American West are the iconic aspen trees. But by the mid-1990s, biologists had noticed that there was something really weird going on with Yellowstone aspen and with aspen across a lot of their range. And um, here's the data. But all you really need to see is that they, they began to realize that the aspen were very old, um, that there had been very little new growth of aspen in the previous seven decades um, from the mid-1990s to the mid-1920s. There were essentially a whole age classes of aspen missing from Yellowstone. Now, that seems like quite a mystery until you walk into a grove of aspen and look around, as biologist um, Ripple did, there he is standing among an aspen grove, and if you look on those aspen, of course, they've been browsed to a very high point along their bases, right? So what's going on? And, and the uh, first guess would be that they're being browsed excessively by the very substantial elk populations um, in and around the, Yellow, the greater Yellowstone area. Now, why would that be? Why would this sort of be out of balance? Why would there be... Uh, why would, be the, why would the aspen be sort of suppressed and why would the elk be sort of running amok? Well, it has to do a little bit with the history of another species in North America. And that, um, to, got a little ahead of myself, and to explain this, this relationship, okay, if the elk are eating the aspen, you might be asking, is there something missing here that should be controlling the elk? And that has to do with the history of wolves in North America. The last wolf was exterminated from Yellowstone in, in 1924. Funny enough, Hmm, that seems to correlate with about the time you, st you start seeing a decline in the new growth of aspen um, over the subsequent seven decades. So if this is um, possibly right, how, how might we test this? How might we know whether this is the effect? Well, as many of you may know, in 1995, wolves were reintroduced into Yellowstone. This is the first one going back in, uh, being handled by all sorts of dignitaries. Um, uh, and so wolves, uh, a, a small number of wolves were reintroduced into, into, into Yellowstone, and they've uh, reproduced since then. So what's happened in Yellowstone over the last 20 years since the reintroduction of the wolves? Well, the wolf population has, has oscillated a bit. You know, of course, there's seasonal changes, good years, bad years, etc. But there's been a pretty steady decline in elk numbers uh, across the range. Uh, perhaps maybe a 60 to 70 percent decline in elk numbers. And that was predicted by a biologists. Put a, a pack hunting carnivore that likes elk, especially young elk, and that's going to uh, dent elk numbers over time. But what else has happened? Well, if you look at um, what's been going on on trees in the system and you measure the, the degree of browsing in the trees, browsing has noticeably declined, the height of aspen is noticeably increased. So the suppression of elk populations due in significant part to the, by the, to the reintroduction of wolves uh, is having an effect on the vegetation. And in fact, more effects than, could, than anyone predicted. Because if you look at other populations of trees, things like uh, willows, uh, here's a picture taken before wolf reintroduction. And this is in the foreground, this is willow that grows along stream banks in Yellowstone. It's, it's uh, heavily browsed. But after wolf introduction, they see that all this willow starts growing back along stream banks. Same with cottonwood trees. And it turns out that that willow is both a favorite food and building material for beavers. And once the beavers get in there, they start sort of changing the course of the river, building dams, things like this. And it turns out in the 20 years since wolf reintroduction, you see an increase in the number of beaver colonies um, in the Yellowstone system. So introducing a carnivore has affected the herbivore, the elk. It's affected the trees like aspen, willow, cottonwood. But in turn, there's a cascading effect on other creatures like beavers and even on other predators like coyotes and foxes and things like that. So reintroducing the wolf introduced one of these cascades and induced the rebound of trees and other species in Yellowstone. And that illustrates a fourth, if you like, Serengeti rule. And that is, and this is perhaps the hopeful part of the talk, and I'll try to send you out of here with these thoughts, that, that nature is incredibly resilient. And I think more resilient than biologists thought. In the sense that, given a chance, in this case it would be habitat, protection, time, 
Populations can rebound dramatically. This is, you know, 20 years, that's not a lot of time biologically. Some of these changes were evident within the first five to 10 years of the wolf reintroduction. Given time, given habitat, species can rebound. In fact, communities can rebound. We know this from other examples, for example, protections that have been afforded by the Endangered Species Act. Let me show you a few examples of the rebound of species we know about um, that have been protected, say, over the last century. Northern elephant seal in the late, 20th century, uh, late 19th century was hunted down to perhaps as few as 20 individuals. That population is now at 200,000 because of protection of marine mammals. Sea otters have a very clear history because of the fur trade. They were hunted all across the Pacific Rim uh, from Asia, across the Alaskan coast, down uh, to California, um, reached a low of perhaps 1,000 animals. Protected beginning in 1911, there was over 100,000 otters, sea otters now. These are voracious carnivores. They're incredibly uh, consuming um, shellfish and other things. Uh, Northern Pacific humpback whale, you can see these numbers, maybe a 12-fold rebound over about 40 years. Bald eagle, very famously, of course, was suffering because of DDT and other things, down to 487 breeding pairs in the late 60s, close to 10,000 breeding pairs today. And of course, the gray wolf in the, in the Yellowstone general region, which was zero until reintroduction, um, is now in, in much larger numbers. So just look at the scale of the rebound, both in terms of magnitude and time. Species can rebound if they're given habitat and all that. Now, that's pretty impressive. That's individual species being protected. But what about places where you know, more than just a predator like a wolf is missing or one, more than one species needs to be protected. You would imagine it's much harder to restore. Well, that, but that doesn't stop extraordinary people from trying. So I'm going to tell you one last story tonight um, from a place you may have heard about, maybe not. If you're not, I hope you're going to enjoy this. Um, in Mozambique, Gorongosa National Park. Let me tell you the story of Gorongosa. Um, in the 1960s, it's a park, it's a park really in the geographic center of the country. Mozambique is a huge country in southeastern Africa, um, twice the area of California with a thousand miles of Indian Ocean coastline. And Gorongosa was the jewel in its national park system, visited in the 60s by jet setters and Hollywood stars and all that because of a great concentration of large mammals sort of in the center area of the park. Elephants, hippos, buffalo, and lion. In fact, lion is the symbol of the park. There are about 500 lion um, counted in, in Gorongosa in the mid-1960s. And, well, here's a little footage from that era. 1963, that's the safari vehicles, folks driving around Gorongosa. The lions are evidently so well-fed that they just kind of nap right by the wildebeest. <laughs> that's it. But um, then history turned. Um, after the War of Liberation from Portugal, a civil war broke out in Mozambique, lasted almost 20 years. And unfortunately, Gorongosa was almost the geographic center of that civil war. It was the major base for the rebels and the site of many pitched battles. And some of the buildings you see in this footage are actually Gorongosa Park buildings. There you see out, out the edge. A million people killed, five million made homeless. And so at the end of that civil war, this is what Gorongosa looked like. Um, all the park facilities had been shelled. Um, of course, there was no staff around. All the vehicles were bullet ridden. The whole park was overgrown. Um, but it gets worse than that. Um, census taken in the late 1990s after the war showed what had happened, or I guess in the year 2000, uh, pre and post war. So you can, I had to, we have to fiddle here with the numerical scale, but you can see you went from about 14,000 buffalo to about 50, from about 2,500 elephants to maybe 100, from 3,000 or the 3,000 hippo to about 50. Just work your way across from about several hundred lion to zero. There are no lion detectable uh, left in the Gorongosa system in the year 2000. And that's really the way it would have remained. The combination of decimation from the Civil War and continued poaching of whatever was left, that's really the way things would have remained, um, except for when one individual entered the picture. And his name's Greg Carr. He's an American uh, who uh, turned from business in the 1990s to philanthropy when he was keenly interested in both human development and conservation. And in 2004, he signed a joint management agreement with the Mozambique government to try to restore Gorongosa National Park. So 
We're about 12 years into this project. Um, let me show you how it's going. I'll start with a little home movies. My wife Jamie and I visited there uh, last summer. So here's a little helicopter and some other footage across Gorongosa. I want you to understand the system. This is a giant lake at the center of the Gorongosa system that swells during the wet season and shrinks during the dry season. And on the surrounding plains, this really rich, silty soil is sort of a salad bowl for whatever animals are there. And you can see a couple of water buck hopping around. And there's all sorts of rivers and tributaries that sort of come in and out of this lake. We're going to fly up over a piece of it here in a second. Um, what you're mostly seeing are water buck here in the foreground, and you're seeing some bird life. And then we're coming up here, and maybe the kids can spot who the, what these guys are, what those black dots are in the river. Can you figure them out? Yeah, that's a lot of hippo. And just, just a little tourist hint, you want to be several hundred feet in the air away from hippo when there's that many of them together. It's, it's an overwhelming smell. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a sight for sore eyes to conservationists, right? Hippo populations are there. And then I'll take you a little bit inland and we'll see what else is going on in, in Gorongosa. There you go. Look at the fraction of youngsters in this shot, right? Look at all the youngsters. So what's going on in Gorongosa? Well, how the large animal populations change? Well, in 2000, if you added up everything I had in that chart, antelope, buffalo, elephants, hippos, everything, fewer than 1,000 of them combined. The census last year, 71,000. A little more than a decade. Several fold changes in most of those populations, from 100 elephant to maybe about 600, um, same, similar change in hippos, etc. Pretty dramatic, right? Well, the habitat's there. The food's there, the water's there, the place had been emptied by us, and now those populations are booming. I'm also gonna share with you, uh, well, so I'll tell you, you may ask about the lions. Uh, at, at the 2015 count, there's 66 lions in Gorongosa, which is a little bit of a concern. The proportions of other things to lions are not what they are historically. And lions are tricky, you can't just introduce lions because you know the prides fight and things like that. But if you understand what I, as you understand from what I told you before, carnivores are really important in systems in terms of the whole regime of, of how animal numbers are controlled, particularly the smaller prey. And, um, and there were no, uh, just, just lions were the only known large predators, uh, no wild dogs, no leopard, etc. until three weeks ago. This is a shot from a motion capture camera This place. There's dozens of these cameras all over Gorongosa, and for the first time in decades, that's a leopard in Gorongosa National Park. Probably migrated in from one of the adjacent areas, and evidently uh, several more have been spotted since then. But this is, this is dated uh, September 2nd, and I got sent this photo by Greg Carr, somewhat excited, that a uh, little more than excited, um, that there are leopard in Gorongosa, and there are now a few leopard we know in Gorongosa, probably at least a breeding pair. So the carnivores are coming back and diversity of carnivores is there. So it's quite hopeful. So this success, and Greg was told in 2004, if, you know, why are you even here? It's hopeless. You know, the place was absolutely in shambles. You could drive for hours and only see, you know, a single baboon or a single warthog. Well, it's a really different story today. And that success has inspired a bolder vision. Gorongosa is a really big park, but... There are surrounding wild areas. In fact, that's probably where a fair amount of the wildlife has come from, is some migration that's coming in like, like leopards. And so the vision is to now really expand this protected area. Um, so the, Gor the main Gorongosa Park that I've been talking to you about is here in this bright green. But the vision is to expand this to a conservation area that's of mixed use. There's over 175,000 humans living in this entire area. And much like Serengeti, where there's plenty of human settlement around Serengeti and uh, Maasai and pastoralists, etc. So there's farming, there's herding of cattle, etc. So in a similar sort of model, a mixed use that will support both human development and the wildlife populations. And that involves expanding now the conservation area all the way to the Indian Ocean, uh, to the Zambezi River. And that would be about an eightfold expansion in area. The total area outlined here would equal that of the entire Serengeti conservation area. And this uh, 
plan was just approved most recently by the president of Mozambique and his ministers. And this area has the capacity, we think, to hold about 10,000 elephants and 500 lions. So that's the vision uh, for Gorongosa. A, a marked reversal. I don't think I can give you any more nouns and adjectives from its fate uh, just a little over 10 years ago. And as for the Serengeti itself, remember I told you they were thinking about building a road through the Serengeti. Well, I have it from a very, very reliable source that the only roads to the Serengeti are still unpaved. And let's hope it stays that way. Thanks a lot. So, a few minutes for questions. Sure. So now we can open the floor to questions from you for Dr. Carroll. So please step right up to the microphones on either side and Fire away. Indeed. All right. I have, On the uh, left. <laughs> in the case of large, the large animals you describe, in effect, they pass through a bottleneck which has spectacularly reduced their genetic diversity. Doesn't that greatly increase their vulnerability to disease and really small things like diseases and viruses? Great question. Uh, absolutely. So well understood from other situations that uh, when animal populations go through a bottleneck, go to small numbers, say for example, 50 breeding pairs or so, um, they're essentially inbreeding with each other, you know, siblings are mating with siblings, cousins are mating with, with cousins, that weakens um, the vitality of the population, makes them more susceptible to both genetic disease as well as um, to other agents. Um, that issue for the Gorongosa populations, I think, is just now really being studied because they've had this boom, which almost caught everybody surprised, the magnitude of the boom, and now the question is, what does the structure of these populations really look like? The, the Restoration Project did bring in some animals from outside Gorongosa. They brought in a couple hundred buffalo in the early years that Kruger Park was generous enough to donate. But they quickly learned that moving animals 600 miles is expensive, difficult, stressful on the animals, et cetera. So they, they hadn't done anything of that larger scale. They've done some stuff with a few, just a few elephants, just a few hippos, um, and some zebra, and a few wildebeest. But I'm really talking small numbers, handfuls, fewer than, a, fewer than 20. Um, but that, of course, does seed a little bit of diversity there. But I also think what's going on is there's migration coming in from adjacent areas. That small population that was left in the core of Gorongosa, just like we can see from the leopards, they know this from lions as well, that there are things wandering in from afar that are not, um, uh, were not part of that original number. So the rebound is probably a combination in individual species of what was there, rebounding, some immigration from adjacent areas, and in certain populations, a little bit of seeding from animals that were deliberately imported from afar. Uh, but there, one of the great things that I admire about Greg Carr's plan for Gorongosa is one of the first things he did is build a research center in the center of Gorongosa and invite the world's scientists to come study what was going on there. And so now it's quite a hotbed of research and there are many people coming to study questions just like you framed. What's, what's going on with these populations? So when numbers have you know, rebounded into the thousands, people aren't so worried, but the lions at 66 or fewer, people are really worried whether that lion population is vulnerable to some sort of collapse. And that, of course, will have a, a cascading effect. Should we go left, right here a little yes, bit? Yes, I think so. Okay, Next to be fair, yeah. The model that you showed in Garangosa, will that be modeled after what they did in Kenya, for example, the reserves uh, that are contiguous to the Maasai Mara? And is, yeah. there, is there back and forth between the Kenyans and... Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think they're trying to implement as many best practices as have been learned in Africa. Obviously, there's good stories and not such good stories. So um, let me just tell you a little bit about the Gorongosa philosophy. First, that this is a partnership between the Carr Foundation and the Mozambique government. And it has many, many facets. Human development being central. There's as much or more money being spent outside the park on the human population as inside the park on, um, you know, patrolling and science and, and things like this. Um, that includes health clinics, schools, community centers, farming programs, farming so important to relieve some of the pressure on the land of the, uh, uh, both within and, and around the park. 
dealing with wildlife conflict. Um, the elephants don't recognize park boundaries, and uh, they like maize, you know? So, you know, villagers do wake up with a backyard full of elephants. Um, so that, I think, is really a, a big part of the narrative of the Gorongosa project, is that there's no way this park can make it unless the Mozambicans do well. And that also includes, really, the, the, the game plan is for Mozambicans to take over this whole operation. So there's intense science education going on in Mozambique and in Gorongosa of training the next generation of, of talent in, in Mozambique. So uh, I don't know if that's giving you just a little bit of flavor of the project, but, but the idea is, is that this is going to be a mixed use area, that there's going to be agriculture going on. There's going to be, you know, people going to school and going to work with wildlife in the area. And so this is going to have to be, you know, worked out. All right, thanks. Hi, I hope you have some positive examples of responses to persistent disruptive species, uh, perhaps invasive species or others that uh, do bad things to an entire system. Yeah, good examples of what we do for invasive species. I mean, I, obviously we've, you know, <laughs> I look along the beltway and I know what we're trying to do to the, the all the vines that, are, that actually drive my wife crazy. Um, you know, I, I think that's still a, a work in progress. I, maybe people in the room can think of some, some cases. Obviously, we try to get our hands on these invasive plants. We try to get our hands on these invasive animals and, and get them out of the system. I think, um, you know, it's, it's so, I mean, you know, you know stories like the cane toad in Australia and all that, and that, you know, a lot of systems have been really degraded by invasives. Um, so the management strategies for those, how to erect barriers, how to purge these systems of invasives that are, that are degrading the, the, uh, the communities, uh, I just think there's a lot of work to do. The only I would thing I would say about that work is that you know, what I discovered, and you know, I, I talk about being a member of the molecular biology tribe, we're, we're the very well-funded, very high-prioritized tribe of biology in, in, in America and around the world because we're, we, we are heavily focused on basic discoveries related to human health. But I think we've got to take in mind that ecological health is a big part of human health. And we've got to spend more money, but it turns out it's not that expensive. When I say spend more money, I'm not talking about, you know, Iraq levels money. Oh, I should, maybe I shouldn't go there, should I? Okay. <laughs> go um, there. I'm, yeah, all right, whatever, it's the season. Um, Goring Goso alone, for example, the project I'm showing you, the human and park side of that is a six million dollar a year project. I mean, how can we not afford to try these sorts of things? So I, I think that, you know, the sort of things that need to be done, they're not about just making places pretty, they're about making them functional, and the costs involved are really not prohibitive. Um, I think we just need to support the science better and to support the management better. And that, that the one thing I learned through a lot of the case studies that I looked at and a lot of the people directly involved told me, you know, you need good science and good management. And often those two things, you know, are unfortunately not both there on the ground. Either you don't know the science or the science hasn't been done, or you know the science, but the management strength isn't there in places like parks or, you know, just on paper, they're not, they're not really being um, actively managed. So good science and good management. And, and this is, you know, I really do believe this is affordable. It just has to be prioritized. We swing in this way, yeah. Thanks, as an avid scuba diver, um, I'm concerned a lot about the degradation of uh, habitats uh, underwater. Can you talk a little bit about the same kind of rules, but uh, under the sea? <laughs> and perhaps also where, I mean, if I'm gonna spend my next dollar going somewhere to support a system and a culture, where are some success stories and where are the greatest threats? And of course, you know, I like lionfish. I'm doing my, I do my bit to eat them and get them <laughs> out of the system. Yeah, um, okay, so I, that's a big question. We'll just for, for sake, we can even talk a little bit afterwards. Let, let me pick out a couple of things. Um, you, you, may, you guys may start to get sick and say, God, this guy's an optimist. But I, I really don't think, I, I take this from Greg Carr. He would say, you know, the alternative is a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? So maybe we're all doomed, but we might as well give it a try, right? Okay. <laughs> So in that spirit, um, first, I'll, I'll give a fair amount of credit um, in, in the U.S. fisheries, uh, the Pacific and, and Atlantic fisheries. We all know stories where things got messed up and bad decisions were either made or not made or whatever. But in general, 
about four dozen fisheries have been declared overfished at some time, and about half or more have been restored. One thing that goes on in the ocean is that fish are incredibly productive. They make a lot of young, and if you reduce that extra mortality induced by us for a little while, boom, fish populations can really rebound explosively. Same thing in a lake, etc. So there's good history and better, and I'm going to just say, better, better management of our fishery populations here. Um, I'll contrast it with, say, for example, the Mediterranean, which has got 28 countries fishing it, and fish stocks there, and if you like to dive in the Mediterranean, anyone can tell you what, what, what the situation is. It's, that's a case where we know the science, and we don't have, and the management has not come together. Um, where else should we go? Coral reefs, I think probably everybody's pretty aware of concern over what the combination of ocean acidification and warming is gonna do to certain reef systems. Reefs are really important as nurseries. Reefs often have these um, trophic cascades on them, essentially, because you have, I mean, the ocean is a, is a fish eat fish world, right? I mean, it's just predators everywhere, and we happen to like to eat the really big ones, right? And of course, more meat per catch, right? So big cod, big tuna, there's been big changes in the populations of large fish over the last century, particularly due to industrialized fishing, and that has cascading effects on the abundance of smaller fish, and that has cascading effects, of course, on you know, reef systems and, and uh, grasses, you know, seagrasses and nearshore systems, and shellfish. Things that we like to eat, like scallops and all that kind of stuff, it cascades down. Sharks, carnivores that have roared, you know, uh, the predators that have you know, roamed the ocean for 400 million years, we all know sharks have been heavily overfished. That's had a lot of cascading effects. So uh, the prospect I will give you is, you know, first we've got to know what's going on, and then second of all, you know, we've got we to issue, we've got to regulate ourselves, right? I mean, there's rules and regulations in nature, and we need them for these systems to be productive. Um, it's in our own best interest. I think commercial fisheries, you know, accept that. And, and it's, that's been going, that's been the practice for some decades. So I think we just have to emulate those best practices in a lot of situations. You said where to spend your tourist dollar. There's a lot of good stories, I think, in, uh, you know, from Bonaire to the Philippines um, to Dominica, you know, there, there, I think you can, you can find places that have done a great job at protecting their reefs um, that got ahead of the, got ahead of the situation. Not I don't mean the Philippines got ahead of things, but they really have been doing a lot of things to, to um, improve the situation. So um, yeah, let's see what we can do to support those communities or support the agencies, Conservation International, World Wildlife Fund, other ocean-based organizations that have got some great conservation projects going. Again, not a lot of money, takes time and work, but not a lot of money to reverse some of these things. A um, couple of um, related questions. So when habitats are threatened, can you, is it typically the keystone species that disappears first? And as you are planning on restoring a particular habitat, how well do we understand the models for a trop trophic cascade? In other words, do we have all the variables so that you know all the pros that will happen, but also the cons? Great questions. Um, Here's the thing, a lot of what's happened, when, especially when I list some of these species like otters and all this, what's often happened is the large animals are, are out because we wanted them or we didn't like them. We don't like bears, we don't like wolves, we don't like lions, we don't like leopards, we don't like sharks, okay? So large predators, and there's great scientific evidence and very recent papers published very prominently about this, are, are just heavily overexploited. Either, or in other cases, tuna and cod, we do like them. We just we eat, we eat a lot of them. So we have disproportionately reduced the large predators you know, across the globe. Tigers go on and on and on, right? So you can tell that if obviously they're regulating the, any, any, whatever they are regulating the numbers of in the, in the herbivore group, there's, there's gonna be cascading effects. There may be effects on vegetation, a whole lot of things on, on communities. Now, suppose you walk into a system and you're like, hey, what you need is another 100 tigers. Well, I don't know that we know enough that uh, that's job one. You know, it's just to start pumping predators in, you know, wherever we can see them. Uh, because the, the population, you know, the community has shifted. And I don't think we know exactly what's going to happen. I think we kind of ease into these sorts of things and observe these, these things over time. Yellowstone, there, it, it was really interesting. Yellowstone was, you know, there were something like two or 300,000 public comments made 
before wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone. You know it was a very controversial thing. But just the history of the wolf and ranchers and all that in the American West, you can understand that this was a, um, a very anxious um, proposal. But there were a lot of predictions made. You can read them. And now we know which ones came which direction. Some animal populations were thought that they might be dented a little bit more by the wolves than they were. Um, other things like what happened to some of the vegetation were pleasant surprises, you know, in, in a biological point of view. So that's just to say, no, I don't think we know how everything works to know exactly what's going to happen. I think we might have, in many cases, a good idea of where to start. And uh, it's sort of a, you know, begin to implement, monitor, 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 tinker, monitor kind of situation so that we're not all eaten by tigers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, hello. Um, this is all very well and good. But the, re the reality is that 99.9% .9 or whatever it is of all the species that ever been on this planet are extinct now. Mm -hmm. And the other, the other part of that is, if, I mean, we're a keystone, the human beings. Um, so are bacteria. If you had to put your money on one of the two, um, <laughs> who would you put it on and also, what does all this say for, for our survival overall? And, and you can exclude the possible consequences of the upcoming election. <laughs> <laughs> it's a three-part question that was so artfully put. Um, so uh, first of all, I'll bet on the bacteria. And there are a lot of people in this room uh, who, who would uh, be able to explain that even far better than I, the three and a half billion year history or 3.8 billion year history of life on Earth. Um, Humans, to quote Bob Payne, and I'm sorry to say the late Bob Payne who passed away this year, uh, are the overdominant keystones, meaning we're, we've inserted ourselves as keystones all over the place, right? We're sitting on top of the cascades in the ocean, above the predatory fish, we're sitting above the predators on land, we're inserting ourselves in the food chain at all sorts of levels. Um, okay, but that's the way it is, okay? And there's seven billion plus of us, you know, we're pretty large mammals, but not quite, you know, not quite on the right-hand side of the curve that I showed you earlier. Um, the practical thing is, you know, how are we going to uh, help nature supply the things that we need? And that means just managing our resources better. And yes, extinction is a fact. That's why, in fact, I, I started by talking about mass extinction anyway. It's happened a lot in history. But I don't think we really need to help it along um, at the rate we've been doing it. Um, you know, we... We are, I'll, I'll take the other, gosh, you guys think, oh, what a ridiculous optimist. Look how clever we are. I mean, we're incredibly clever, right? Look at all that we've discovered. And actually, kind of, I would almost say give ourselves a break. We didn't know anything I just told you, we didn't know 50 years ago. We didn't know whether nature was kind of regulated from the bottom up or the top down. We didn't know anything about keystone species, trophic cascades, et cetera. We didn't know any of that while we were kind of doing whatever we were doing on the planet. Now we know a little bit better. So... Can we regulate ourselves? You know, I, I'll give you a couple stories. Look, we're trying, you know, we've, we, we averted so far full nuclear exchange, you know? <laughs> that would have been a concern, you know, at some point in the last 50 years. Um, we've eradicated diseases like smallpox, which involved hundreds of thousands of people in all sorts of countries across the world banding together to do something that people thought were, it was absolutely impossible. And, you know, that's a couple of the favorites off my list. So there's a, there is history of collective action, even of countries that don't get along, um, you know, when people recognize the, the common threat. And I think you can get some of that sense, you know, whether this treaty signed in Paris by, what, 170 countries or, uh, you know, a, a major doctrine, you know, uh, propounded by the Pope uh, on essentially... Earth as a common home and trying to awake people to awaken people to the situation that we're in. So we're kind of clever. Now look, you know, if you were not coming, if you're looking down from another planet, you could say, hmm, which bet am I gonna make? But I just come back to this. You know, we we we're all here. We might as well give it a try, see if we can kind of do better than we've been doing. We know a little bit more. And um, and I think obviously, of course, we have an obligation to do that. So um, 
for the moment, I'm going to bet on human cleverness um, and with a whole lot of stupidity mixed in. <laughs> All right. We have time for one more question. Thank you very much. You gave the example of the aspen as vegetation and its impact. Um, but there are many areas in the earth uh, that are being degraded on a vegetative scale um, from grazing to um, decimation of rainforests, et cetera. Um, are, have you seen some of the rebound in that type of situation as you have described with more of the animal focus? Yeah, there's a, there's a magnificent story in, in Costa Rica um, in the project led by Dan Jansen over the last 35 to 40 years. And are there some folks here? They, they gotta, come on, there's some ecologists here in this room, right? They gotta help you, come on, you're, you're all plainclothes ecologists, et cetera. <laughs> Um, uh, th this area in, in, in Costa Rica was pretty much, um, you know, flattened for, for, for human purposes. And, you know, it's tropical forest and it's an incredible biodiversity. I think there's something like 10 to 15,000 species of butterflies and moss there. And Dan is trying to count every one of them. This is the kind of biologist it takes. Um, that's just one example. There's a lot of stories of sort of the reclamation or restoration of areas that have been pretty much converted all to human use, you know, coming back. So, and again, not an incredibly long time scale, you know? I don't think 30, 35, 40 years is, is uh, you know, is, is ridiculous. Um, you know, one of the things we gotta pay attention to is, you know, in farming practices, that's why it's such a big part of the Gorongosa program, is getting yield out of the land that we are using. You know, in Mozambique, they're probably getting 10 or 15% of the yield that they could be getting from their soils. If you can help them with farming practices, you can take a lot of pressure off the land. And of course, the other bad farming practices also degrade that land, so it's actually useless in, for future generations. So, um, you know, you're, here, you're only gonna hear doable. You know, I, I think we have to keep identifying the doable. And maybe, you know, maybe I take that approach because it's the gloom and doom is everywhere, right? And, there are success stories. There are people working hard on the ground. There is knowledge that's being gained that um, when deployed can halt degradation or reverse um, to full restoration. So I think that's, we gotta, we gotta shine a spotlight on the things. And I would say just two weeks ago, uh, here you go again. Watch this, this is, this is your, another Walt Disney moment. Um, two weeks ago, uh, I, Greg Carr and a lot of people associated with the Gorongosa Project we're all there in the Senate wing of the Capitol in a downstairs meeting room for a dinner to honor the president of Mozambique. And there at the same table were senators, Republican and Democratic senators that had worked on, had been to Gorongosa, who had understood what the USAID was doing in Mozambique and Gorongosa. They were the uh, uh, leading uh, representatives from Congress on the Interior Committee, both Republican and Democrat clearly good friends, clearly dedicated to this sort of purpose. The UN was there. I, the, you know, Goran Gose is being spoken about as a global model of, of, of integrating human development and conservation. And you know, the good that can come out of it is, is you know, it doesn't just accrue to one political party. So um, you know, I, I see things like that, and I, I think people see this, this sort of makes sense, that we cannot stand idly by, and if there are people willing to do the work, and if the money is available, let's just do it. Okay, thanks.